So um, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Yvonne Greig. And um, Dr. Yvonne Greig is a midwife lecturer at Edinburgh Napier University. Her areas of research interest are living with obesity during pregnancy and consultation skills. Her doctoral work explored how midwives raised and maintained dialogue around obesity issues. She has practiced clinically for the last 30 years and for the last 10 years has combined academic and clinical practice, moving into full academia two years ago. Yvonne is a keen educator and has had the privilege of working in Kenya, Greece, Egypt, where she has supported professionals in both academic clinical practice to improve maternity care and increase safety for mothers and babies. This is Yvonne's first time presenting on VIDM conference, and she's delighted to be here. Welcome, Yvonne Craig. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eunice. That was really nice. And hello, everybody, and thank you for coming to listen to me today. Um, I'll apologize now if I get a bit tongue tied. Um, so, as Yuna said, my area of interest lies really in obesity, and I want to share with you today some of my findings from my doctoral study, as well as a bit of background about the risks of living with obesity. Now, Eunice, can you help me? How do I move my slides along? Okay. 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 So I'm just going to tell you a bit about a bit of my background, really, my, my clinical background. So I um, had the privilege of working in the Edinburgh, University of Edinburgh Medical School as a research midwife. And part of that role was being the lead midwife in a clinic that actually catered for women who had a BMI greater than 40. Now, these women were referred to the clinic by their community midwives. But some of these referrals were done without the, the woman's knowledge or consent, and they would just get a letter through the door from me. So once I realised what was happening, I then started to call these women um, on the Thursday or Friday before their first appointment on the Tuesday. And they were, there were so many emotional reactions that I got down the phone. There were tears. They thought they were going to get into trouble when they came to see us. And it was really quite upsetting to listen to them. But when I made that call, they were really grateful for it. And there was honest and open discussion. And most of them came along to the clinic and they were very happy that that happened. Now, when I spoke to the community midwives about the, any of the, these discussions or not discussions, um, they would say to me, oh, it's the elephant in the room. And I did have a lovely picture of an elephant in the room, but the, the technology I was asked to take some of the pictures off, so I did. The community midwives told me that, oh, Yvonne, it's a really tricky thing to raise that topic, really tricky. And that got me thinking, why is this so tricky? I was working in a medical school with very skilled obstetricians who were exploring the effects of living with obesity during pregnancy. They were looking at sugar levels, cortisol levels, all things like that. But nobody was actually thinking, what's going on here? Why aren't we actually talking frankly to women about this? Now, this is just a recap. Um, and be before I go any further, I also want to say that if this has any resonance with anyone and you find it upsetting, please go um, if you do find it upsetting, but come back to me so that we can have a discussion because I am overweight. My husband is extremely overweight and my children have been overweight. So this is not a get at anybody. And I'm just going to talk a wee bit about the background, about the risks that women um are exposed to if they live with obesity. And this will not be a surprise to you all, you're all midwives. Um, so living with a BMI of 30 or more does carry risk for the, the woman during her pregnancy. She's at risk of miscarriage, fetal abnormality, mainly cardiac, and that's thought to be because of the high blood sugar level that she will live with. Blood pressure complications, including preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, again, high blood glucose levels, prolonged pregnancy, and then for therefore the incumbent risks of perhaps needing induction of labour, caesarean section and its incumbent risks such as wound infection, blood clots because of immobility and so on, 
postpartum hemorrhage and postnatal depression. And there is more and more information coming out and evidence coming out now about the psychological effects of living with obesity and anxiety and depression are very much featured there. There are risks to the baby. Fetal abnormality, as I have already said, preterm birth, shoulder dystocia, childhood obesity, moving into the sort of ongoing risks now. There is now evidence about slower cognitive development for children who are born to obese women rather than those born to women with normal BMI. And there's also much more evidence now of these babies going on to develop neuropsychiatric conditions such as autistic spectrum disorders and so on. So we as midwives, I believe as a profession, we need to be proactive about discussing this issue with women. And that was my whole basis for my doctoral work, how midwives go about this. It's not really well understood. There is global, global evidence to suggest that we, and when I say we, I mean globally as a profession, we are fearful of causing offence to the women because we want to always be that supportive professional. So the tensions, as I've said, they exist for midwives when discussing the topic of obesity because we don't want to cause offence. We're, we're a nice bunch of people. We want to really look after our women and make sure they feel safe and well cared for. But also the global evidence suggests that we don't feel competent in advice giving when it comes to discussing obesity because of lack of knowledge, lack of perceived confidence and competence in our knowledge base. And also there, there is now emerging, but there was a lack of national and international guidance about what actually to say to women. What should we be saying? What should we be telling them? So the aim of my study really was to explore what the barriers and facilitators were that influenced the community midwives um, when raising and maintaining dialogue about living with obesity. And in the UK context, those of you who are not from the UK, we have, our midwives are, some are based in the hospital to give the inpatient care and then there are um, teams of midwives in the community and they look after the women close to their own homes in clinics. So I interviewed 13 practicing community midwives, consent, they all gave consent and the interviews lasted 20 to 80 minutes and were all recorded. They were also asked to complete a practice diary of sort of giving me insight into how they had constructed their appointment over the, the last three times they had spoken to women who had lived with a raised BMI and some did that better than others but nevertheless got some really interesting data. So data from both the interviews and the practice diary were analysed thematically with the aid of the Envivo software. I don't know if any of you have heard of that or uh, used it before, but if any of you come to research in the future, I'm sure you will. And it's really an elaborate way of copying and pasting many of the quotes into particular categories. So I, I used, um, going into the philosophy that underpinned this, social constructionism. If you consider that we construct everything that we do and the antenatal appointments are a construction and the philosopher Gergen um, very much drew on his theories about this construct and how we as teams within our various social and professional contexts, how we develop behaviours and language and habits that's specific to particular groups and my particular group was the community midwives. So what did I find then? So what I found was that constructing relationships with women was really important to the midwives. They really valued this relationship and they didn't want to do anything to jeopardise it. So obviously you want to build up a good kind of mutual relationship and that really put it in a nutshell. And the midwives, they, they seemed to believe that developing this relationship affirmed their role as the women's advocate. You know, uh, one where you can, they can trust you, they're happy to tell you anything and they can ask you anything that's worrying them. Yeah, you know, just that you're there to support them and you can get them through this pregnancy safely. So that was really important, this, this issue of this relationship and getting them through this, this life event safely. 
We also felt that relationship building was really important. And this was where the, one of the tensions arose because they felt that to discuss obesity in the context of relation, building a relationship really could be damaging. So there was a sense that although building the relationships was a key part of the midwife's role, that tension existed because they, they really wanted to avoid at all costs raising sensitive topics. At that initial meeting, you're trying to build up that relationship and the last thing you want to do is annoy. And I don't want to cause harm or cause them to be upset because they're anxious and it's their first appointment and they're excited. Fair enough. Information exchange between the midwives and the women was also really important. So the participants acknowledged that they had learned their communication informally and on the job. And this for me was the real crux of my research because I knew a lot about living with obesity and the risks and all of that. But when I really analysed this data, what I found was that the midwives had learned their communication on the job. And as a student and during many years of practice, rather than as a result of receiving formal education, and I think that's really important. And it can be seen in this quote, you, I think as a student, you've got such a fantastic position. You're in such a fantastic position because you get to work with different midwives and see how they do things. And I was forever, oh, I like the way she said that. Oh, I like the way she did that, you know. So you pick up a lot of positive ways of saying things through watching other people. And then I think when you qualify, you just have to learn what your style is. But it takes time to do that. You know, and that's quite a long quote, but I think there's quite a lot in that and it's quite informative. Now, in this part of the world, we use a very um, structured institutional questionnaire that, to ask women questions. It's very ordered, one size fits all. And it was the institutional questionnaires that were used to record the information in the maternity notes that appeared not only to provide permission for the midwives to raise the topic of obesity, but also to devolve the responsibility for doing so to the institution. And that can be seen in this next quote when they're talking about um, calculating BMI. So I say the computers just worked out your BMI. Were you aware of your BMI? Do you know what BMI is? And just, you know, explore, explore it with them. And they just go, well, I know I'm a wee bit heavier or sometimes if it's a second time mum, they'll go, well, I'm definitely a wee bit heavier than I was in my first pregnancy. Now, that's just a quote out of a really big transcript. But actually, what I found was the conversation didn't go anywhere else after that. The BMI was recorded and that was that was the end of the story. And again, yes, you follow the booking appointment. So this is the questionnaire that I'm talking about. So the midwives followed this, this questionnaire. You follow that, yep, you weigh them and you put the weight down, but I never discuss weight and I have never been told that weight is something we should discuss. Now I find that quote quite alarming because as autonomous practitioners, as we are in the UK, we don't need to be told and we don't need permission. We have a professional right to discuss these things. It's evident based and it clearly says in our code of practice that we should be giving women evidence-based information. Now, another thing that the professionals did was they used the medical protocols or the clinical protocols I could say. So the institutional questionnaires used to record the information in the maternity notes appeared not just to give permission to raise the topic but also devolve that responsibility for doing so to the institution. So again, they were saying it was something, it's not really my responsibility to discuss this, but I'm told I have to do it. You know, so again, um, that is the same quote um, about BMI, but actually there is another quote. Um, and I only just noticed this before I came on, so I must apologise. There's another quote where the midwife says, because your BMI is over 30, I have to do a glucose tolerance test and I have to refer you to the anaesthetic clinic. And actually it's about informed consent and discussion with the woman and asking what she wants to do and does she understand these things. So midwives appear to really value this midwife woman relationship. They prioritise it over discussing other sensitive 
other sensitive issues of which obesity is one. So the other things are things like smoking, cessation. Now, in this part of the world, there are places, there are organisations that the women can be referred to to support them in giving up smoking. There are organisations to support them if they are suffering from domestic or intimate partner violence. But when it comes to obesity and weight management, there is nothing. This is supposed to be, um, you know, holistic care, but there really is nothing else other than if a woman has a BMI over 40, they get referred to a specialist clinic and they have a bit of additional surveillance um, in terms of growth scans and being seen by the dietitian and so on. But if somebody's, somebody's BMI is between 30 and 40, there is nothing else for them. And same with the other sensitive issues. If there is somewhere for the midwives to signpost women to, they'll discuss it because they've got permission on these questionnaires. But if that doesn't exist, they avoid it. And that can be quite catastrophic, ca catastrophic for some women. What I found really interesting was that the midwives prided themselves on being good communicators. But I don't know what they were measuring this good against. Was it social or professional communication? Because communication is what I'm doing to you now, is what Eunice did when she introduced the session. Professional communication is quite different. And I'm not sure how much formal education individuals were given around their professional communication. So I find that quite worrying that they're just assessing themselves, particularly if they have not had any formal communication. And if that's the case, then what exactly are the students seeing? The, as I said to you earlier, the clinical protocols were viewed as giving permission, giving the professionals permission to raise some topics with the terms I have to often being raised with respect to these additional investigations. And the midwives don't have to do anything. It's a professional responsibility to discuss these additional um, investigations such as a glucose tolerance test to screen for gestational diabetes, such as referring these women to an anaesthetic clinic so that they can be assessed by the anaesthetists should, when the time comes, they need any anaesthetic input. But it's not, the midwife doesn't really have to do anything. So what I think my interpretation of all my data was that by using these questionnaires and the protocols, what the midwives were really doing was conflating the women's pregnancy journey just to a list of problems rather than making sure it was a tailor-made, women-centred approach where decisions were made in conjunction with the woman. Now, doing that, I believe, risks omitting some of the topics that are very relevant to some women, whatever they may be, whether that might be, you know, somebody who's really tocophobic and concerned about um, pain relief in labour or concerned about will the baby be well? It doesn't really matter. But using these pro formas and focusing on the clinical protocols, I think, does risk us forgetting that the woman should be at the centre of her own care and her own decision making. And the other thing that I think is really of concern is that midwives learn their communi communication skills informally and on the job. And that suggests a weakness in pro professional practice and non-adherence to the code. I'm talking about the UK um, Nursing and Midwifery Council Code of 2018, which really clearly says that we should be giving women evidence-based and up-to-date advice. So evidence-based and up-to-date advice about living with obesity does tell us that these women are at risk of various complications. So we really have a professional responsibility to discuss it with the women and indeed to discuss how they can optimise their lifestyle choices. So that was my findings. Now, that any of you who work in research will know that completing a research study doesn't really answer questions. It always creates more. And that's exactly what's happened here. Um, so in order to minimise the risks, I believe that our midwives and our student midwives need target or it may optimise their practice if they receive targeted education that encompasses um, evidence-based consultation models, because I think 
we don't really as midwives have a consultation model. The consultation models that are out there are medically based and that's where as somebody goes along to a, a medical person, a GP or a surgeon or whoever and says, I have a problem, will you fix me? In this context, it's the women who are coming to us probably not thinking they've got any problems whatsoever. And we're saying, well, actually, your risk, your health may be at risk here. So can we discuss how to, for, for how I can support you to optimise that? And that's the difference between a medical consultation and a midwifery consultation. So I think midwives need to be made aware of that and I think we need to really develop our own consultation model and I think that our practice could be strengthened and midwives empowered to confidently raise and maintain dialogue regarding these sensitive topics. Now the reason I say that is in not so much in my research but there is evidence globally that some midwives are really reticent about raising the topic because they are afraid that complaints are raised against them for being offensive and that is why we need a consultation model that will facilitate our practice. And so if somebody goes to a manager and says, so-and-so talked to me about it, said I was fat. Well, actually, if we do it in a professional way, they, can, they really can't argue. There were a lot of limitations to my study. Um, it was very small. It was limited to one geographical area. That was Edinburgh in the east of Scotland, right on the fringes of Europe. It just focused on midwifery practice and the views of the woman were not sought and that's one of the, the next things I want to do. And the findings may have been strengthened by looking at the length of experience and approach to communication um, education that each midwife had had. But I didn't do that because of my findings came along when I analysed the data. But again, that's one of the, my future things. So what am I doing now? Well, I have developed a an e-learning module and I have just piloted that with some of our students at Edinburgh Napier University and I'm currently analysing the data. It does look like though that the, the view has shifted on the post-exposure um, questionnaire that, that our student advice now are much more women-centred and how they might approach this topic and I'm also carrying out a literature review um, to explore what educational interventions are being delivered for nurses and midwives with respect to consultation education. And I really want to carry out more uh, interview research to ex really explore what the women expect from a midwifery consultation and, if, and what the midwives themselves want and need or feel they need um, in terms of education. So my take home messages for you today, sorry, I'm going on a bit. We need to view and remember that living with obesity is a serious risk for pregnant women and pregnant people and develop our practice to approach it meaningfully so that we don't actually damage this trusting relationship that is so important to us as midwives. We want the women to trust us. So we have to really view this as a serious health issue. And if any of your educators out there, I think we really need to consider adding this as a topic in its own right to curricula rather than threading it through the programmes and saying, oh, obesity is a risk for preeclampsia, it's a risk for diabetes or whatever, because it is a, a very big subject in its own right. Um, the risk of psychiatric illness, all these things are really important for us to acknowledge. And attention needs to be given to equipping midwives with the ability to construct these meaningful consultation episodes, as I've said to you. So that's where I am. I'm really in, in the middle of what seems like a much bigger project as a result of all of that. So thank you for your attention. It's just a quick overview, really, of my work, and I hope there's a lot more to come. I do have some sources. If anybody wants a copy of this, I'm sure it will be recorded, but you can get in touch with me and I can hand, send it on to you as well, these references. So I am uh, going to um, thank you. hand back to you now. Uh, thank you so much, Yvonne, um, for that nice presentation. I don't know, do you still have other comments? Um, no, I'm happy um, 
I see quite a lot of people have uh, put some comments and sorry, I, I can't read them all <laughs> at the same time, but um, very happy to take questions if anybody wants to ask me anything. Um, there's a comment by Ella Kane. Um, who is asking about that quote about students picking up skills in practice is interesting. Students in UK spend 50% of their course in theory where they learn about health promotion and models of health promotion. They learn about behavioral change model and motivational interviewing, which might fit in discussing smoking or other public health issues. Then they go into practice and are not facilitated to apply the theory to practice because they don't see promotion techniques in practice used by midwives. So I don't know whether that is something well, you want to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thanks, Eunice. Yeah, you're right. Um, we do talk about health promotion and health protection and all these things in our theoretical programs. But it would appear that our midwives, excuse me, who are out there, don't actually translate that into their practice. And the proformas that I was talking about, certainly in this part of the world, they're electronic. Uh, I think most places do have electronic notes now, certainly in Europe. Um, so it's, you know, do you have a healthy diet, so-and-so? And so-and-so -so says, oh yes, yes, I have a very healthy diet, but our BMI is 38, tick. And that's it. So that that's why I think we need to move away from using, not from using the electronic performance, they're there for a reason. We have to gather that information. It's a risk assessment. I don't mean that, but what we need to approach our consultations, I think, in, in more of a way, if you, if you watch medical staff consulting, for example, they won't write anything down at all until they've had the conversation with that individual. And I think we need to, to just redress that a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm just liking these questions because it's quite interesting, actually. Having been a midwife for quite a while, I've never thought about uh, really um, now talking to women who are pregnant about obesity. I, I tend to wait until after pregnancy, then I start speaking about obesity. So I think this is quite an interesting uh, research. So they may not, uh, Elena is asking here, they may not have consultation model, uh, but in UK education, they do study health promotion model. So I don't know whether that is quite related to consultation model. Well, I suppose it is. I mean, they go out there knowing the theories about behaviour change, health promotion, but that's what I'm saying. They don't then translate that into the appointment, or at least that was my findings. I mean, now that other part of, parts of the UK and the world, that might not be the case, but these were my findings when I did my data collection, and that was about four years ago now. Um, and from what the students are telling me, and this is just anecdotal, it's not exactly um, research, but the students tell me that nothing very much has changed. And in my little um, hub site, that I developed around education because it was very targeted on education. The data from the pre-exposure, the students who filled in the questionnaire, pre-exposure, it's all very talking from the textbooks, learning by rote, have a healthy diet, blah, blah, blah. But the post-exposure data suggests that they have really, they've switched their thinking and it's become much more much more awareness of being women centred and understanding and promoting what actually is a healthy diet because in my hub site I've put quite a big section in about nutritional science that's something I can't speak for other parts of the world but it's something that we you know we say this phrase have a healthy balanced diet now the Scottish diet is one of the worst in Europe um you know, we, we the, the amount of sugar in the Scottish diet is unbelievable. And I stood in a supermarket the other day and just watched the, uh, the amount of obesogenic food was unbelievable. Um, in other parts of the world, it may be different. So the students were much more um, aware of how to promote a good lifestyle changes. And there's also recommendations in the, both the Scottish and UK governments about how much exercise we should be advising women to have. Now that's not easy because 
you know, the social determinants of health. Not everybody can afford to go swimming, go to the gym or whatever, but they can walk. That's free of charge. So there are things that we can promote and, and discuss with women. We can't make anybody do anything, but we can discuss that with them um, and say, you know, is this possible? So the students and the post-exposure data are seem to be much more aware of the tangible things that they can suggest for women. And they seem to be much more aware of the nutritional advice that I put in my, my hub site. And I, I worked at, well, myself as a learning technologist who helped me into workbooks so that it could really reflect as they went along. So it seems to be quite useful. Okay. Um... Thank you very much for those comments, Yvonne. There's another comment by Karen Johnson. Thank you for this information. Cecilia Javit, uh, what wonderful resources you have made available. Um, then uh, Cecilia Javit, I'm eager to see more of Yvonne's work. So I think it's um, Cecilia Javit also. Um, has a comment, Yvonne and listening friends. I have a website full of educational material for you and other educators free of charge. Please go to advantagemidwifery.org. Uh, the materials include curricula and approaches for talking with clients. There are also materials for clinicians and patients. Um, Thank you. And then there is also a comment by Stephanie. Yes, we label ourselves as good communication communicators far too often. How can we find a model you are developing? I think that's a question you may need to handle. Um, sorry, what was that question? Um, they are interested in finding the module that uh, you are developing. Well, it's it's um, it's invited access only at the moment. And it's part of Edinburgh University's, um, Edinburgh Napier University's Moodle community site. However, I have just signed a contract to write a book and it's, it is based on what I have written in that module. So there will be a book being published next year on all of this. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll let you know when that is published. I, I'm not sure how I proceed really with my module. I'm going to get this published or hopefully present at ICM next year about my my website, the data from it, and then hopefully I can give people access to it after that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Other comments are about uh, uh, Karen Johnson. Thank you, Yvonne, for this important work and thank you for an excellent presentation.